Oh, hi. Hello there. This is Let's Talk About Miss Baby, and I am your host, Liv. Last week's episode on Heracles and all of his many boyfriends got me a little inspired because I talked about Adonis, as he's often determined to be one of the many lovers of Heracles, alongside his more famous lovers, Aphrodite and Persephone. And I realized that it has been five years since I told that story, and in the last five years, I I haven't spent nearly enough time talking about the goddess of love and beauty. She with the depth and the nuance and the sexual agency, Aphrodite. And thus, here we are. But, gods, uh, this episode has transformed so many times since I started writing it. First I thought, let's talk all about Aphrodite's lovers, and then I realized that I desperately wanted to cover Aphrodite's origins in the eastern goddesses, Inanna slash Ishtar and Astarte, and then I realized I needed more time for something so deep as those, so I went back to the lovers, and then God, finally, I realized that there was more than enough on Adonis alone. And so here we are, and I'm sharing that with you, uh, because sometimes I feel like I'm slowly losing my mind. Uh, But damn if I won't try to bring you all down with me. Today, though, ultimately, is Aphrodite and Adonis. Oh, gods. Adonis. Still, before we dive into the absolutely wild stories of Aphrodite and Adonis, I want to let you know that I'm going to be doing a anniversary Q&A episode of this podcast. Because in just a couple of weeks, we're going to hit the six-year anniversary of this show, which is just absolutely wild and obviously something that I want to mark with a special episode as I do every year. (laughs) And it is also because the day around the time of this anniversary every year I come to the same conclusion, but in this case, the anniversary episode is the day before my own 35th birthday. And thus, I I want to take a few days to myself uh, without writing 6,000 words of a script. So we are doing a Q&A, but not just any Q&A. I also want to hear what you love about the podcast, how long you've been listening, what your favorite episode or moment is. Basically, I want you to ask what you want to ask or tell me what you want to tell me, and I'll just read as many of the messages on the podcast as I can like I did for that four-year anniversary, too, I want to, like, add in some clips of people's favorite moments, so let me know. You can submit your questions or whatever else that you want to share through the form at mythsbaby.com slash questions. As always, it's linked in the episode's description, and please have your questions or notes in before July 13th, around that time, so that I can put everything together in time for this anniversary episode airing on the 18th. And with that out of the way, let's get right into the woman who started it all for me, my favorite Olympian goddess, and the one I think is far and away the most interesting, our very own Aphrodite. This is episode 218, famous for being hot. Aphrodite and Adonis' tumultual relationship and Eastern origins. The story of Aphrodite and Adonis is a fascinating one. It's one of the most famous, I would say, in myth, with Adonis himself having become one of the most famous mortals of Greek mythology. Broadly famous for being the most beautiful man. I mean, gods, we use the name Adonis to describe a beautiful man. But the stories we have aren't actually found in any detail in very ancient sources. Instead, we know that their story was definitely ancient, very ancient, but in terms of what survives uh, uh, as stories for us to tell, it tends to be sources from closer to the Roman period or late Hellenistic, Hellenistic broadly, if not after the Roman period even. And what that also means is that the stories contradict the living fuck out of each other, as is the case uh, with sources like this. And isn't that everyone's favorite part about Greek myth? (laughs) No? I mean, it's become my favorite part, so. It's just confusing and weird and consuming and contradictory and... Gods, if it isn't interesting, and thus, I ramble about it to you. What we do know for certain about their story is that Aphrodite is, like all the Olympian gods, fickle as fuck. 
<laughs> which begins our necessary introduction to one of her most famous lovers, Adonis. But here's the thing. <laughs> the birth of Adonis is fucked up. Or rather, there are a number of different versions, different possibilities for his birth, uh, but one of them, the most famous one and well-accepted one, is seriously fucked up. So let's start with the less fucked up options, shall we? I really debated whether to share the fucked up with one with you, like, at all, uh, but it's found in Ovid and it's referenced in Pseudo-Apollodorus and then it became the most commonly accepted <laughs> version and it explains the origins of the mirror tree or shrub, so... I guess I'm keeping it in. We will get there. For now, the first option for Adonis's parentage is that he's just born on the island of Cyprus, where his father was named Kinneras and his mother was Metharmi. This is mentioned in Pseudo Apollodorus too, and it seems to be what he believed, whereas the fucked up one um, is just something that he's saying someone else wrote. Who knows? He also says that Hesiod said that Adonis was the son of two people, one named Phoenix and the other Alpha Sabia. This bit of Hesiod is lost to us, but we know about it because of Pseudo-Apollodorus. Now, these are brief versions of a parentage, right? Just names, really. Whereas, the fucked up one is an actual story. His birth is also basically because of Aphrodite, which adds a whole other level of, of fucked upness. <laughs> and, well, I don't want to actually um, tell you the story myself, so I'm just going to read to you just a couple of sentences from Pseudo-Apollodorus so that you get the idea and I don't have to find details or try to make it sound entertaining and not horrifying. Also, the story appears in far more detail in Ovid's Metamorphoses, Book 10, which is coming up fairly soon in a reading episode, so if you are desperate for more of this, you can listen then. In the meantime, trigger warning, because it's fucked up. There's definitely assault in here and probably the nastiest level of incest that I've ever read in Greek myth, <laughs> and it's all caused by Aphrodite. It's not a long quote that I'm going to read, so if you want to skip it, you can probably just hit the skip ahead button once. And with that absolutely glowing and not at all concerning introduction, here is how Pseudo-Apollodorus describes Adonis's origins. Quote, Theas, king of the Assyrians, whose daughter was Smyrna, because of Aphrodite's wrath, for she did not honor Aphrodite, Smyrna developed a lust for her father, and with the help of her nurse, slept with him for twelve nights without his knowing it. When he found out, he drew his sword and started after her. As he was about to overtake her, she prayed to the gods to become invisible. The gods took pity on her and changed her into the tree called Smyrna. Nine months later, the tree split open and the baby named Adonis was born. So yeah, it's gross and horrifying. And Anyway, while those are all the ways of how Adonis came to be born, this version seems to be the most widely known and accepted. And, um, you know, it's the most incesty one, too. Adonis is very famously known as the son of this woman named Smyrna, and this connection to the Assyrians, that's going to come up later. His birth is more often than not linked to the tree and the incest. But fortunately, it's him who we're concerned with today and not his conception. So we don't have to dwell too long on how he came to be born. Like so many stories from Greek myth, the most famous parts of Adonis' story have become romantic. We think about Adonis as being beloved by both Aphrodite and Persephone, and the goddesses fought over him. It's become a nice story, and yet, yeah, it, it, it's not all that nice when you look at the sources and consider what they're actually saying. See, when Aphrodite saw Adonis for the first time, she was immediately taken with his beauty. Aphrodite loves beauty. She loves beautiful things. She is the goddess of it, after all. And so when she saw this man, uh, who's still a child at this point, who's absolutely so just fucking gorgeous, she decided that not only did she have to have him as her future lover, one hopes, but she, she couldn't let anyone else get near him. 
this is really early in his life. And Aphrodite tucks Adonis away inside of a chest so that only she could be the one to admire him. And so that uh, I suppose and hope he could grow up to be an adult. And in the meantime, you know, he'd be safe from other prying eyes. And, and Aphrodite could just wait for him to be old enough to be her lover. And yeah, that's it's just about as weird as it sounds, except that it gets weirder when Aphrodite has Adonis in this chest, but she eventually gives him to another goddess for safekeeping. She gave the chest that contained a living child to the goddess Persephone, trusting her to help Aphrodite protect Adonis while he grows to adulthood. Persephone, though, also has eyes, and she's also a goddess. And so when she saw Adonis... She had the same reaction as Aphrodite. She became absolutely smitten by him. And again, now we have to just kind of trust and assume that he grows to be an adult. Go with me on this, because it isn't long before both goddesses are just fully fighting over who gets Adonis. Aphrodite is certain that she has claimed to him. I mean, she stole him away and trapped him in a chest, after all. Let alone the fact that she caused him to be born. So obviously, he belongs to her. Cringe. But Persephone's got him now, still in this chest, I guess. So, since Aphrodite entrusted him to her, and so because of that, she too decides that she has a claim over him as well. And no, at this stage, at least, as far as we know, no one has asked Adonis what he thinks of the situation. They will eventually, kind of. The goddesses are fighting between themselves over him, and their fighting gets to be so much, so intense, that Zeus is called in to mediate things. And while Zeus decides that the, the most natural solution is essentially to divide Adonis's life up into thirds. One third of the year he would spend with Aphrodite, another third he would spend with Persephone, and the final third he can do whatever he wants with his own life. But, well, and here's where the guy gets a bit of agency, so good for him. Uh, Adonis chooses to spend his own third of the year with Aphrodite, and so the two immediately become lovers, you know, two thirds out of the year. They're sexing it up, one can assume. Their time as lovers, though, isn't well documented. Instead, what we know is just that it was cut short when Adonis was killed by a wild boar. Now, Adonis is always killed by a wild boar, but the reason the wild boar is there to kill him is varied. Was it sent by Ares because he was jealous of his lover Aphrodite loving another man? Was it sent by Artemis to punish Aphrodite for what she'd done to Hippolytus? Whatever the reason, the boar took out Adonis with a single swipe. Aphrodite saw, but was too late, ran to him, held him, and he died in her arms. Where his blood stained the ground grew the anemone flower. Now, in some later versions that we have of this story, it's suggested that maybe Adonis was created to punish Aphrodite, whether it was intentional on his part or not, but it's for what she did to his mother. She caused his mother's ruin and the horrible nature of his conception, and so it was a punishment to the goddess of love that she would love a man destined to die that way. One of my sources, a book called Aphrodite by Monica Carino, actually suggests that after his death, he unsurprisingly ended up in the underworld, but there he got to live kind of full time with Persephone, which is just then further punishment for Aphrodite. Because these characters and what happens in their story doesn't actually have like a full retelling, you know, start to finish, we kind of just have to surmise all of these things. And for a character who is so famous, it, it's really lacking in very ancient sources. But the actual worship surrounding Adonis was pretty huge. In the classical period, there was even a festival dedicated to worshipping him, called the Adonia, where mostly women paid tribute to Adonis, and specifically they commemorated his death and Aphrodite's grief. 
Even Sappho mentions the festival, which suggests that it seems to have been popular in Athens, but also it clearly had to have made its way to Lesbos in the East in this earlier period as well. And according to this source, again, Monica Carino's book Aphrodite, the festival took place in July and was celebrated by women of all classes, even hetera, you know, the fancy sex workers of the time, who might have even got to invite their lovers to join in. So, so fitting. So Aphrodite. The woman would then plant what they called gardens of Adonis, quick growing plants that they would, they would plant in these baskets or shallow pots. And once the plants had sprouted, they would take them up to the rooftops of their homes where it was, you know, the absolute hottest. And in that heat, the plants would immediately wither and die, symbolizing Adonis's death. And the women would mourn them, just as Aphrodite did Adonis. Quirino goes so far as to emphasize how important it was that the women climbed a ladder to reach their rooftops to participate in this aspect of the ritual. And a ladder, <laughs> which in ancient Greek is just called the climax just feels very, very fitting. And this is all depicted on pottery of the period, which also shows like how important it was to the culture. And the latter serves also to symbolize like this bridging of the gap between realms, you know, the living and the dead. The festival would continue with the women enjoying feasts and wine and celebration, and, and that portion was in honor of the time that Adonis would return from the land of the dead to spend his time with Aphrodite. Gods, how fascinating is all of that? We have so little in terms of sourcing on their story, what happened, their relationship, what have you, and yet we have all of this information on this incredible festival dedicated to him. It's such a an amazing example of these stories and concepts that we know were vital to the culture of the ancient world, but don't survive for us today to, to fully understand the, the importance of them as a story. Oh God, the way I had zero idea how this episode was going to go, truly, like I'm so thrilled that I decided to not only look at Adonis, but also I bought this Carino book. Incredible. And now, as I really briefly mentioned at the top of the episode, one of the most interesting aspects of Aphrodite also comes from her origins as a goddess. Like many of the Greek gods, we can assume that she developed over time and through influence by other cultures of the region. But unlike a lot of the other gods, we have a lot of clarity into where Aphrodite almost certainly originated. See, Aphrodite has roots with two Eastern cultures that came long before the Greeks, the Mesopotamians and the Phoenicians. She can be linked pretty clearly to the goddess Inanna from Mesopotamia, who went on to be called Ishtar with the Assyrians and the Babylonians. And that name is a bit more recognizable today. Fun fact, it has nothing to do with Easter. Don't let anyone convince you otherwise. And they, she also is connected to the Phoenician goddess Astarte. And I want to devote an entire episode to talking about these three goddesses, but it's going to take a lot of deeper research. And thus today, Adonis. Still, while I have every intention of leaving that to this future episode, my plans today were disrupted because, well, it turns out that, that Aphrodite's link to Adonis is also deeply connected with Inanna and Astarte. Adonis as a character and the story of his lovers and decision to spend his life in two different worlds seems to come pretty directly from these Eastern traditions that came long before the Greeks ever adapted them to their characters and their mythology. He's associated with Inanna through her own lover, this hero god named Dumuzi, also called Tammuz, whose death she laments. And... Apologies on my pronunciation. I have no idea how to pronounce Mesopotamian words, and I should really look into it. So when the Greeks picked 
Adonis up through this association with Aphrodite that she already had with these Eastern goddesses that she shares an origin with. They seem to have placed Adonis's own Greek origins on the island of Cyprus, which, you know, not only directly connects him to Aphrodite, who is mythologically born there, but it also connects him, I, I take, more directly with these Eastern origins, given Cyprus, while part of the Greek world, is so far east, and so it inherently has these further Eastern connections. Of course, that's another reason why Aphrodite is said to be from Cyprus. It's this acknowledgement that while she is a Greek goddess, she has her origins in these much earlier Eastern goddesses too. And I mean, to me, uh, gods, I hope you guys agree. I know this episode is kind of wild because there's so much or so little story actually involved, but this is just what makes Adonis and his story so much more interesting for so many reasons. First, we don't have any early forms of the story that survive from the Greek world, like I said, but obviously we know that it, it's ancient as hell. The story of Adonis with Aphrodite appears on pottery, there's references to him in Euripides' Hippolytus, and, and so many other pieces of evidence that make it clear that their story is very old, but it this idea also kind of lends itself to maybe that the Greeks were well aware of its eastern origins, of this story of Aphrodite and Adonis, and maybe so they, they weren't even that concerned with recording their own version of the story because because of this like it was so closely tied to the east and likely there were so many versions of their story that had even deeper origins to the east that maybe it wasn't even an issue to have an explicitly greek version of the story they could just depict their version visually rather than concerning themselves with recording it in a way that it would then survive for us today. And finally, we're going to finish off today's episode on the goddess of love and Adonis, this super hot man she fell in love with and treated very weirdly. <laughs> you know, that's saying it kindly. There, Because of the importance of Adonis, contextually and historically, there are some absolutely wild things that have been said about him in the ancient world. Just ancient writers had so much to say about Adonis and sometimes Aphrodite too, and I want to share them with you all. All of these quotes can be found on theory.com and I've linked in the episode's description. First, we have Elian, who is a Greek natural history writer from the 2nd or 3rd century CE, very late. And he's just sort of explaining a fish, I guess. And he says, quote, People like to call it Adonis because it loves both land and sea, and those who first gave it this name were hinting, so I think, at the son of Kinaras whose life was divided between two goddesses, one who loved him beneath the earth, the other above. And then there's Athenaeus, who's a Greek rhetorician from the same kind of time period, and says, quote, Nicandros of Colophon, in the second book of his dialect lexicon, explains the word brenthis as the Cyprian term for lettuce. In this, Adonis sought refuge from the wild boar which killed him. Callimachus, too, says that Aphrodite hid Adonis in a lettuce bed, since the poets mean, by this allegory, that constant eating of lettuce produces impotence. So also Eubulus, in the Defectives, says, Don't put lettuce on the table before me, wife, or you will have only yourself to blame. For in that plant, the story goes, Aphrodite once laid out Adonis when he died. Therefore, it is dead man's food. And Kratinos says that Aphrodite, when she fell in love with Phaon, hid him away in fair lettuce beds, while the younger Marcius declares that it was in a field of unripe barley. And yes, that was fairly nonsensical, but I just had to share with you all these views on lettuce and impotence. Gotta love it. Now, this next quote also contains a bit of a correction from, from last week's episode on Heracles' boyfriends. 
I tried wrapping my head around this one source, Photius, and I, I failed then because, well, sometimes these sources are so fucking confusing and I'm not a scholar, so, you know, such is life. But Photius, you see, who was indeed a 9th century CE writer, who I talked about last week because he had wild things to say about Heracles, was actually apparently summarizing another writer's work, Ptolemy Hephaestion. And while I can't figure out when that man would have been writing, but essentially my point boils down to the fact that Photius was summarizing work that he had read, but that we don't have surviving today, so it was older than Photius, possibly much older. But again, I can't figure out just how much older, or if we even know anything else about Ptolemy Hephaestion, because uh, both of those God's damned names are used by such prominent other historical figures, including the fact that there are a bazillion Ptolemies. Basically, it made Google useless to me. Regardless, this dude said something weird and baffling, and I want to read it to you, so I'm going to. Quote, Fantasia, a woman of Memphis, daughter of Nicarchus, composed before Homer a tale of the Trojan War and the adventures of Odysseus. The books were deposited, it is said, at Memphis. Homer went there and obtained copies from Phanites, the temple scribe, and he composed under their inspiration. Adonis, having become androgynous, behaved as a man for Aphrodite and as a woman for Apollo. Now, yeah, a lot happening there. Um, the bit about Adonis seems to be unconnected to the earlier sentence. I don't totally know where it's coming from. But I just like this idea that maybe, you know, Adonis was more non-binary than, than we might imagine. But most importantly, I love this idea that he's presenting that a woman wrote, essentially he's saying that a ro woman wrote the story of the Iliad and the Odyssey before Homer and that, like, Homer copied her. I don't think there's any evidence um, beyond this weird quote that that's the case. And this quote is coming from... You know, uh, we don't know when this Ptolemy Hephaestion, but Photius is 8th or 9th century CE. So, like, you know, almost uh, 2,000 years after uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey. Grain of salt. Love it anyway. And then there's this connection, again, by Photius and Ptolemy Hephaestion that says, quote, Arimanthos, son of Apollo, was punished because he had seen Aphrodite after her union with Adonis. And Apollo, irritated, changed himself into a wild boar and killed Adonis by striking through his defenses. So there's this idea that, Adon that Apollo wanted to kill Adonis. And I think it's connecting to some idea that Apollo had a relationship with Adonis, which I haven't found elsewhere. I love it. Anyway, and then finally, there's this quote by pseudo Hyenus, who, you know, whatever version of him that might have existed was from the Roman period. Uh, and it presents a whole other connection to other famous myths. Quote, Some have also said that Venus and Proserpina came to Jove for his decision, asking him to which of them he would grant Adonis. Calliope, the judge appointed by Jove, decided that each should possess him half of the year. But Venus, angry because she had not been granted what she thought was her right, stirred the women in Thrace by love, each to seek Orpheus for herself, so that they tore him limb from limb. And thus in this, we have this connection to the death of Orpheus, who was famously torn apart by Thracian women. Um, but in this take on it, Calliope is... Orpheus's mother, and thus when Aphrodite is mad at Calliope, she has these women tear Orpheus apart. Again, it's a very late source. It's probably sort of a later invention connecting these stories because they are both so important for such different reasons. But it's fascinating, and it really emphasizes the impact that Adonis and Aphrodite had in the wider mythology of the world of the Eastern Mediterranean, and, and I suppose into Italy as well, without there actually being any really detailed origin stories for them. And thus why I am fascinated. And I do hope I've made you fascinated too, but as with some of these stories, I recognize it's a bit uh, thrown together because that's what the sources give us.
Uh, nerds, nerds, nerds. Um, thank you as always for listening. Honestly, I had zero idea that this episode uh would turn out this way, but for all it was sounds kind of wild, I recognize I personally am thrilled because the actual story of Adonis and Aphrodite is just so limited, and I just I wanted to tell it alongside some other lovers originally, but God, there's just there's so much context to this story, so much historical importance and cultural importance, even if we have very little of the story itself. It's wild to me how famous the story of Adonis is, how famous the character is, without any of the additional and important context that he is, you know, absolutely based in Eastern mythologies and traditions. He's become so famous, and that's just sort of been almost forgotten. It's not lost on me that the man who is famously the most beautiful man in all of Greek mythology, and who we use as a term to describe a beautiful man in the Western world, is from, like, Iraq. Meanwhile, Western white culture has put this whiteness on him, this traditional idea of this handsome white Western man, and his origin story is explicitly from Mesopotamia, modern Iraq. Phew. I mean, it's not remotely surprising given Western culture, but it is something else to to dig into, into the background of this story and the character. And just, I love to find all these extra pieces that have been like, for lack of a better term, in this case, like whitewashed over. So anyway, hold on to this. Adonis is far more interesting than you think. And again, it's also this perfect primer episode because next week I really hope to dive deeper into the idea of Aphrodite as being based and originated, you know, in Inanna, Ishtar, Astarte. And I want to talk about those goddesses as much as I can, where the theories of her origins come from, honestly, whatever I can find. So stay tuned. There's just so much depth to Aphrodite, just like there is so much depth to Adonis. It's no wonder that she's been my favorite since I was like 10 years old. Even if back then, I will admit uh, that her being my favorite came from growing up as a girl in the late 90s, and thus an absolute obsession with the concept of traditional beauty. But now she's my favorite because she's fucking badass and problematic and weird and has some of the most detailed cultural origins that we know of. Fucking love Aphrodite. Now, as always, let's end this episode with a five-star review from one of you amazing listeners. This one comes from a user called Pineapples73. Great name. And from my own Canada. Best podcast. Liv is so funny and amazing. I've been a myth lover for a long time, and I am so happy I found this podcast because it is such a great way to learn and have fun. I hope she keeps creating forever. Thank you, Pineapples. I'll try. And remember to submit your questions or notes, favorite moments, like whatever, through the form at mythsbaby.com slash questions before July 13th so that I can answer all of your questions and read your notes and share your favorite moments on the anniversary episode coming July 18th. Six years, man. What the fuck? It's so cool. <laughs> Let's Talk About Miss Baby is written and produced by me, Liv Albert. Michaela Smith is the Hermes to my Olympians. She handles so many podcast-related things. Research being so major right now. It's so exciting. Running the YouTube, creating all the promotional images and the videos and editing and gods, everything. Stephanie Foley works to transcribe the podcast for YouTube captions and accessibility. The podcast is hosted and monetized by iHeartMedia. Help me continue bringing you the world of Greek mythology and the ancient Mediterranean by becoming a patron. We'll get access to bonus episodes and more. Visit patreon.com slash mythsbaby or click the link in this episode's description. Thank you all. You're super cool. I am Liv and I love this shit. Mm-hmm.